So we're going to open up with prayer and land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that the David Brown Center sits on the ancestral lands of the Chicharyo speaking Ohlone people. We pay respect to the Ohlone past and present and recognize that this land was and continues to be of significant importance to this group of tribes. We encourage you to learn more about the history of the Ohlone people and the exciting and important endeavors that are happening by um, the various indigenous groups around the Bay Area today. So with that, I want to turn it over to Brian, who's going to kick us off. Hello, welcome to the AI lecture series. Um, I'm 2023. My name is Brian Strasnick. I work for Kellen Arctic and Planning, but also as the AIA 2022 president. I uh, had several goals as president. The first one was to get us in the office space and we're here here in birthday so uh second one was good outreach to all of our chapter regions so we're a chapter of four counties uh solano alameda napa and Contra County. so we made it to all four counties um really tried to outreach to all you to find more information about what's intriguing to you and we had lots of great um suggestions and, and comments so Ursula is our next president, our president currently, and she's been taking a lot of that information we've got and to be build programs around it. Um, and then third, I wanted to have a lecture series where we could all come together, celebrate the space that we're in, celebrate the legacy of the East Bay. And so we've been doing a nine part lecture series. Can you flip to the next one? Nine part lecture series based on project types. So we started with the history of the East Bay, talked about renovation. Um, last one was planning. I'm going to big scope, big idea of projects for the state. Not working. And today we start really digging into the project types. So tonight we are um, talking about institutional work. All, all of our guests tonight um, are, are, are legends in the East Bay, really, really shaking the East Bay, really creating wonderful work. So we're very pleasure yeah. to have Can them. Switch. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. So talk about this. This is the series. Please keep joining us. They're wonderful. They keep building. Next one. Um, so tonight we are. Oh, the right seat here. But okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> don't, don't I should go back one in that direction. So the tonight's. That's you guys. Wonderful. Tonight's presenters <laughs> are Kraftlib, Clarence, Mwaka, 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 Close. 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 <laughs> let's let's go with that. Close again, but go at Momoya. There we go. There we go. We should have asked Jim. Jim could have said. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Mark L. Italia. Um, so all these individuals are FAIA, the highest honor of um, the co buyer chapter and by the AIA. Unfortunately, tonight, uh, Chuck Davis from the HDB is not joining us. He's ill, so uh, we'll just be the three, but um, very great three that we have. So, really honored to have you all here. Um, so, and then Ursula Curry will be moderating it. Um, I can speak hours and a half probably just on introducing you guys and of all your accolades. Uh, I'll try to keep it really short. Chuck Davis is the principal at the HDB. Ratcliffe is the third generation Ratcliffe at Ratcliffe Architects, so running the firm since 1906, somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, impressive arc of, of projects, starting from residential work and now doing so much work, institutional education, anything you can imagine. So that's great. And then Clarence at ELS has been a uh, strong um, foundation here in Berkeley, <clears throat> doing a lots of work in the institutional realm, um, just high quality work on um, several um, AIA East Bay Awards and, um, and national awards. Um, Clarence is also one of our presidents here at the AIA East Bay chapter, which I just found out about, so thanks for coming back. And Mark um, had a long career at HDD, and for the last seven years, he's been a principal at the H yeah, HGA. <laughs> uh, so Ursula um, is a wonderful person. She is the current president of the AA chapter. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to know you more, collaborating with you. It's been a lot of fun. Anyone who doesn't know her, I'd recommend going to her afterwards. You'd be better by talking to her. 
<laughs> and um, and I'm going to send you to Ursula to wrangle um, the troops. Okay, okay. Nice. thanks a lot, Brian. Please help out to Ursula and, and get better. So I'm, I'm just going to be really brief here. I think we're going to start off. Um, Kit is going to introduce us um, on the overview on institutional architecture. And then Mark is going to lead off with some deliberations on his career. And then we're going to close with Clarence on his um, experiences with water architecture. So we're going to hold those questions from the audience until the end, if that's okay. We'll just allow some deliberation amongst the panelists. So hopefully there'll be a lot of information and a lot of great knowledge that um, you can enjoy. I, have the great pleasure of just listening in on the conversations while we're <clears throat> practicing and really your insight training. So <laughs> thank you so much for being here. All right. Greetings. Thank you for the introductions. Um, yes, our firm does institutional architecture. And um, so there's a theme in my mind that for some people, institutional architecture might be maybe not that interesting, not too much opportunity. And I hope tonight we can demonstrate there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. Um, can you even read that? You can't even read that. Wow. Well, I was going to start out with a definition of um, institutional architecture that I'm using, which is sort of um, educational, religious, medical, governmental, uh, that kind of thing. It's, it's these, these kinds of organizations that are foundational to our society, have a long lifespan. Um, and um, it turns out that those building types, or those actually the organizational types, have many kinds of building types that you can imagine. So that's where you get this rich opportunity um, of, of, of building types to work on. And I'm just going to offer a few reflections. I thought this was going to be a younger crowd. You and I you guys will know all this stuff. <laughs> Are you still working? I mean, still working. <laughs> Um, you got me worried. I know I'm not. So, so I'm, I'm going to talk about procurement, planning and design, and construction. And uh, hello, there we go. So the RFP process. Um, let me just slide this down for a minute. That's going to be my notes. Um, so I started out by talking about. Um, public-private as a split on the institutional side, because there are some differences. And those of you that do this kind of work know that, um, uh, let's see, yeah, I started here, um, that the public client is a steward of public money. And so they're really rigorous about the whole process. They want to be really fair, level playing fields. They have all this mandatory criteria that make you jump through hoops. Know that project's seven years old, not five years old, can't use it. Uh, you try to go after an RFP, they limit who you can talk to. They feed back answers to questions. They're very, very fair. Um, and they usually select off a competitive selection off a short list, which means you don't get really favors you don't think you get. And of course, really one of the fun ones is if you did the master plan, you don't get to the project. You've all had that experience and that's just frustrating as hell, but, but that's what they do often. The private side, sometimes they just select you, which is kind of cool. Uh, or they go from shortlist, whatever. Uh, and usually the, the criteria are kind of more open. Um, what I've noticed too is that you get feedback from these clients. Is when this is probably true for every client, but you know, you know, the team didn't really seem to hang together. You know, so if your team isn't hanging together, you don't inspire confidence with, with the client. And I think what they're looking for is H E L P. I also often say and. Uh, and they really want you to translate their ideas into something that's useful for them. Um, and um, there are two things about the, uh, uh, both public and private do this that really know at me. One is they ask you to sign up for their contract before you even can talk to them and you know what the scope really is. That's a, that's a real good one. And you really get into high-end English courses to dance around that where you sort of, do, sort of not tell them anything. And uh, the second is, is they ask for your fee. Yeah, which I think is highly unfair. And of course, we have the Brooks Act. You all know about that. Back in 72, the federal government said, you got to select people on qualifications, not fees. And most states and cities and so on don't live by that, even though we throw it out, out back at them. So on the planning and design, what's interesting about institutional planning is, is they really come with a very long-term planning horizon. And you'd think that they'd be really careful about that. But no, I don't think they're terribly careful about it. First thing they do is they, they budget in one year and they maybe procure a year or two later 
And so the budget and scope are completely out of sync. So what we try to do is, is insist on a conceptual design phase where we say, we'd like to really go through this thing, pay us a limited amount of money, we'll get all the engineers, we'll scope this thing out. There's a real fee, that's a real scope, and this is a real cost, by the way. So our fee is in balance with the budget because we get nailed on that all the time. I'm sure you do too. The other thing that kind of gnaws at me, though, is because these are larger organizations, usually, you have a, um, a hierarchy in the organization, and the middle managers you deal with don't really have much authority in some ways. They look at time and money. They don't really look at the, that. Well, are you on target? Are you really developing a good project? It just drives me wild. So, uh, but anyhow, so uh, it helps to be able to go to the top. And then, you know, here they have this long perspective, but then they, they do what they call value engineering. I'm being very critical of these clients. But anyhow, they do value engineering. And of course, as professionals, that's what we do. We're making choices all the time. What's a good choice? And then they, they call it value engineering, which in my view, I've been doing this for so many years, is just cost cutting. Um, but they're worried about their social contracts. So brand maintenance is a big deal. Um, now here's another one, which probably cuts across all architects. Which I I must say that I'm I've gotten it, I've kind of gotten away from traditional architecture I have to admit, but the idea of problem solving problem solving is a problem is something that ex it exists right now, that rather than seeking potential we're building fifty and hundred year buildings, but we're not seeking the potential what's the evolutionary arc of that client we should be finding out about that so we provide the right supporting infrastructure so these things are really they're not in sync yet I don't think, and a fun one right at the end is your ex employee can become your client. That's a real fun one. And if he left in a huff, that's problematic. Uh, <laughs> it's happened. In fact, we have one now. Anyhow, uh, which we didn't know, but it turns out that way. So um, another big one is these institutional clients. They've been burned so many times. They think there's got to be a way to, better way to do this. We're going to shift the risk, right? Let's not do design that build. Let's go to design build and hang the team with everything or PPP public private partnership and we'll make the architect an independent contractor so we don't we can we can sue them more easily if they try and represent us during construction and then we'll get a program and construction managers to oversee them which just complexifies things and i remember leroy being how much time do i have keep going all right um <laughs> leroy bean had a great story this is before gordon chong did this thing on design build manual and so on we were up at sacramento all meeting and so on and Leroy Bean, who was the campus architect, stood up and said, well, I've got 10 projects that are traditional design that build, and they're all on course and on budget. And I've got 10 projects that are program managers and design build, and they're all in litigation. And then he just sat down. And so there's something about that, about how do we stay out of trouble? Well, because we stay close to a client. You know, I don't think you, you're sued because there's a problem as much as you haven't met expectations and you're not there really in communication communicating you really want to help them you know and and that's that H-E-L-P again you know are you there so i think keeping clients in, informed is a very a good thing of course you want to avoid bad metrics because that doesn't help you in that conversation and we've all been burned on construction duration that's not aligned with our fee and they say well it's the same amount of work and we say no it's not <laughs> So I'm just buzzing through some of these things, you don't know it all anyhow, but um, I have a, a few slides of, of uh, six different projects, three public clients and three private, and I'll just buzz through them. This was done back in the 80s for the VA, it's a replacement hospital down in, um, oh, has this got a little thing? Does it, doesn't have a, oh, is that it? No, oh yeah. You can't see it anyhow. In the middle, in the middle of the of the slide to the right side, there's a big. Um, oh yeah, can you, you see that? All right, right there. There's a big uh, courtyard. This is a 600,000 foot building, and what impressed me, frankly, in going through the building, is how powerful this courtyard was in organizing your experience to know where things are. You have these single loaded quarters, and you. You could just get around the whole damn building. I, I was, I was, I just wanted to point that out. So we have the acute stuff to the right, all kind of at a higher standard and administration building on the left. But you know, this is the government. So in terms of design opportunity, they want you to dumb it down a little bit, but they let you do a few things at the entrance. And um, we did this project with Stone Maricini and Patterson, by the way. So we were, we were the lead, and we were the designers, and we we just blended our offices. 
you can see the courtyard and then this you probably all know is Terminal 2, Open Airport, Krod Chin, a uh, design partner of mine, and I worked on this with others. And originally we started with HOK to do a terminal, but then that it was going to be right organized at the end of the old terminal, and then that fell on hard times. And so they came up with this frontal gate idea, seven gates. And um, the idea was you're coming from out there in the parking lot where the sky is your ceiling, we said, well, you're coming to a high bay thing. It's like you're sort of coming down in size and space, it's coming to a high bay space, and then you come into a lower space, which is the loading area, and then you finally go into a little tube into an airplane, and uh, and you get your drink. And um, <laughs> so this is the high bay thing on the left with a restaurant overlooking the baggage claim and so on. And you're getting to that compression as you go up these stairs, but it has a little elevator, and you're in the, this was the original, they've since, um, modified this quite a bit some terrible stories we we at the 80 percent cds we did a calculation on on energy and it was coming in at something like 276 kb2 a square foot i think we were allowed 75 or something like that so i, I was going to jail you know <laughs> i mean i was getting lining up people to bring me food i mean it was really really crazy and so we ended up uh using uh tinted glass and this was it turned out to be tinted uh tempered glass and if you do that you get warping and you and the thing just looks like shit looking out under the tarmac it's just a disaster so anyhow uh <laughs> That was painful, but, um, and the chief engineer also said, I don't like this high bay thing, this big space frame. You know, that's the time when Kansas City was failing and these other big long span structures were failing. And sure enough, Ashby Metal, who did the superstructure, had, did not hire boiler makers to do the round welding. So these guys had, every, almost every weld was defective. And so we had to excavate every weld and redo them. And of course they sued, and Judge Avakian ruled against the port. And so they had a three plus million dollar settlement. I mean, it was, and they're just not performing, you know, but they got you, you know. What year was this one? Ugh. <laughs> yeah, I'm really bad at those things. It has to be, uh, you think about that. 86. Yeah, that's about right. Thank you, Kava. Kava, if you just fill in, that would be good. <laughs> All right, there it is, a little night shot. We didn't do that little structure in front. That was done by others. But um, okay, more recently, and this is just a few years ago, uh, we went back to Bolt, uh, Berkeley Law, or Bolt, it was called Bolt all the time. We'd done a design build project on the backside, but they wanted to add to their uh, storage, their library. They had a lot of functions that weren't being met. This is actually a uh, uh, two, two floors below grade. And then this, which you have these 12 foot high, they're as big as you can make and rolling um, uh, compact storage. They're really quite something with huge devices. And then we have this level you can see here on the left and right, and then a garden on the top. But it was taking over this sort of precious outdoor space, which was, you know, that glade, if you remember the grassy glade, and these lawyers says, oh, we can't take that over. No one ever goes out there, but they can't take that over. So we convinced them. And... Um, so as you enter on the left, you come into this courtyard and you see these skylights that are bringing light down two, two floors, a little cafe there on the right. And then there's study halls and so on. And then a huge light well against the existing Bolt Hall building brings light down to this lower level where there's uh, study space and you know library functions and so on. And we had an interesting little conflict with uh, the A&E office at Berkeley because they didn't want us to build at this sort of near museum standard. They said that just offends us. And the Berkeley Lawson, we're paying and we're competing with guys all around the world. So we're we're doing this. And he said, No, you're not. We're sitting here saying, Yeah, let's do it. You know, anyhow, we ended up sort of sneaking all this stuff in. And I think they ended up liking it. I hope. Anyhow. So here's the garden on top and more study spaces down below. Um, now it's a private, this is Kaiser Foundation Hospital. We were in I went to an interview once. Where the, the little two little pods on the right, that was, that's a medical office building. And um, we're told we're being interviewed for a medical office. And they didn't say we're being interviewed for a medical center. 
that dawned on us much later. So we got the thing and then we realized, well, you know, this medical office building is connected to an Ashbad building, but we're building it as a B occupancy to start with. So we actually had to have Ashbad agree to vet this B building for an I occupancy. So it had some little complexities. And then later phases, we filled the building out. It was a lot of fun. And it's it's, ten, it's designed to have more pods added. You know, every time you see that little round thing on the roof, another pod could be added on the other side. And this is well, this is the outpatient entry on the left. And this big, again, Prod Chin was a designer on this. And this is a pretty cool thing. I went there recently, and this is the a corridor, which take, well, let's see, it, it takes you right. Um, it's right along the edge of this, of this, of the both the long the rectangular wings, not the triangular ones. You can see the skylight, just the skylight appearing in front there, maybe. And it just brings in so much light into the space. It's just phenomenal experience. I, I still love it. Um, it's just really feels good. And that's an exit stair on the backside. So more recently, we've worked at John Muir Hospital and um, it's called the phase four edition. And it's that U-shaped building. We're talking with two stairwells and elevators, heliport in the top. That round thing is a sort of a organizing element in the whole scheme to bring these dirty and uh, clean quarters together and distribute to the building. So you'll see some slides about that. So when you enter, you come into this big entry hall, which is really very pleasant. You can, as you wait under great tension, if you have somebody in the hospital, it's nice. And then this is that rotunda at the lowest floor, um, which then reads up through the building. And then we incorporated seven gardens, which was kind of nice um, for the people to get outside and go and. Uh, it was kind of interesting, that, and those were funded by a, a board member. So I like that idea. I'm buying them. <laughs> that was pretty sweet. Um, okay, and very recently we've done. Uh, if you know De La Salle and Crondelet, De La Salle's a boys' school, Crondelet's girls, out in Concord, and this is the Crondelet School. This is an innovation center, and every part of this building is a learning space. You know, all the corridors, the open space, everything. Uh, garage doors open up to the outside. So the whole thing is this kind of throbbing teaching learning space. And um, they have this huge uh, LED screen, which they do all kinds of things on, uh, you know, you could imagine. And then um, uh, these, you can see on the right, there's a um, garage door that's open and these classrooms just spill outside. And, there's a lot of energy in this building. They actually have an innovation officer and their staff, which is kind of interesting, that is concerned about learning. And so we took a real big deep dive on what is, what's the learning process all about? How do you facilitate that? There was actually a guy from um, Steel Desk who came in and he, he looked at that question. So he supplemented our team in, in the inquiry. Uh, so that was, that was a very exciting project. Then finally, this is a STEM building for the De La Salle building. Those are solar operated louvers on the outside, although it's a concrete building, that's not so great. Uh, and uh, then it's got, it's houses a, a variety of different laboratory types inside. That's my show. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so thanks, I think we'll move on to Past the time. Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, I got to say, I'm so sorry Chuck is not here with us. And I hope the AIA East Bay does have uh, some sort of a reprise of this with Chuck, maybe just Chuck alone <laughs> telling his stories because you, you've never heard them. They're, they're, they're quite something. Um, you know, we were we were asked to talk about trends in institutional work, and I think this these trends that we see go far beyond the East Bay. They go far beyond the state. They're national trends. So what I'd like to do is just kind of do a, a cross section through my career, showing different projects over time and how these trends have impacted the design work. Um, I grew up in Detroit, um, getting able to being able to experience uh, a, a cauldron of molten steel from 200 feet away and feel the heat is pretty impressive. Um, we were in the neighborhood of a lot of 
places where that were really active during World War II. So I was really inspired by these big places where manufacturing took place, although they weren't building bombers when I was a kid. <clears throat> But I did get to go to Expo and I got to experience Bucky Fuller's dome. And I think it was a really early experience for me to understand exhibits and volume and space and the world's tallest escalator at the time. I think that day I was more enthralled with the astronaut's chair, but it was quite a memorable experience. Um, baseball stadiums and football stadiums really impressed me. And back then, one stadium served the purposes of both. And we, we weren't building stadiums every five years to accommodate a new sport. Um, one stadium did the heavy lifting. And I've, I've always been inspired by that. I kind of wonder why we don't do that more. Also close to Cranbrook. So very, um, got a good exposure to high design and you know wonderful campus planning, one of the best in the country, right? Within a few miles from where I grew up. And I used to like to build things. Everything I experienced, whether it was buildings or amusement park rides or automobiles, I was there with my Legos uh, building it. And then I went to architecture school and um, I got to learn about the cons, the two cons. Albert Kahn, whose work I had been really familiar with in Detroit, and then Lou Kahn and his work and how he handled light and materiality, always a huge inspiration. I moved to New York City in the mid 80s and worked on interior design projects. And I used Penn Station every now and then, but it didn't look like this. And it was just shocking to me to think that we could build something like this and we could tear something like this down. It really, it really moved me and it, it really made me question how we value our public realm and our public buildings. Um, I was very fortunate uh, throughout my career of actually being able to collaborate with artists, not only in helping them do their sculpture or their work, but embedding their work within the architecture. The, the project on the far left is Rector Gate. This sits in the shadow of uh, World Trade Center. It survived 9-11, but it was with artist R.M. Fisher. And when I did that project, I knew that we were building something that would probably last for a long time. And now when I look back 30 years later, Nothing that I worked on in New York City is there anymore, all the interiors projects, but, but this gate is still there. Um, I moved to California about 33 years ago, and I went to work for EHDD, and I was inspired not so much by the houses of Joseph Eshrick, but by the aquarium. And because I had made the shift, my thesis was actually a redesign of Penn Station, and I, at that point, I recognized that I really wanted to be in the business of designing public architecture. And this project has probably had the, the single biggest impact on my career in, the, in, in understanding a, a repeat client, a legacy client that actually comes back and gives you repeat work. I think it's only happened one other time in my career. Um, but understanding that client, understanding how to build a building to withstand those kind of elements. And in that time at EHDD really, getting to work on exhibit projects that were kind of once in a lifetime projects where you're dealing with artisans, fabricators, exhibit designers, installers, <clears throat> structural engineers that have to design a building uh, to withstand the forces of a large cat or uh, a million gallon tank. So these are things that happen in everyday buildings. Um, in 1997, I moved to Chicago to open an office for EHDD and uh, the commission was the redesign of the Shed Aquarium. They had designed an expansion to the shed, but they had really done nothing with the original building. So this was looking at sort of 70 years of neglect. Um, we did a master plan and we looked at um, image on the, on the left is sort of bringing new life and looking back in time at how the original uh, rotunda would have looked, correcting the mistakes of the 70s. And then image on the right, <clears throat> peeling back the layers and exposing something that the public never got to see. So uh, the lessons learned on this project, large uh, project in Chicago, dealing with entitlements for the first time in my career. We had to work with an attorney who had gone to law school with, Leo, with uh, Mayor Daly, orchestrate all the, all the public presentations. So there was a real sequence to that. The other thing that was really critical here that I've experienced on a lot of institutional projects is you got to do this work in phases and they have to keep open while this stuff is going on. We can't afford to close uh, these museums. 
through uh, Karen Feeney's introduction, got to work on a lot of um, zoo projects. This is a project that Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, and um, it housed the Okapi. They had never had them on exhibit. That's the animal on the left. Um, they live in the Aturi rainforest, and they survive by means of camouflage, kind of like a zebra does. And the zoo director, zoo directors are not known for their love of architecture. They, they would just as well bury everything under a pile of rocks. Um, he said, OK, you got to make this building disappear. And he was being truthful. So we came up with a way to camouflage the building using uh, sort of a paint by number uh, asphalt shingle, time honored material in Chicago, could be installed by union contractors. Um, and the building kind of comes to life in the wintertime. And when you need it to go away in the summertime behind the foliage, it really does disappear. So it's kind of a budget way of dealing with that. Um, a couple of years later at the uh, Free Zoo in Chicago, the Lincoln Park Zoo, um, the zoo was really trying to create a Northwoods environment for kids, inner city kids who might never experience the forest in real life. So they kept talking about wanting to be under the canopy of a tree. And we had the somewhat unfortunate circumstance of having a building that was oriented uh, north-south with a west-facing glass wall. So we worked very closely with uh, our landscape architect, Mark Robertson, and using the roof uh, water runoff and uh, irrigating a riparian grapevine that's set about four feet off the front of the building. So in the summertime, you've got this thick, dense, vegetation, which really feels like you're under a tree, blocks the heat gain, gives the client what they wanted. And then in the wintertime, everything defoliates. And in the gray of Chicago winter, you get all this daylight that you're, you're really needing. So a way that the um, director, by the way, wanted the building to disappear too. So we <laughs> fulfilled his dream. Um, at the same time, I, we were working on a monograph for EHDD. And I really felt it was important to set an introduction because at that time there had never been a book written about Joe Etrick. And there was a lot of people who had written articles in magazines and, and, and parts of books about his uh, handle of daylight. And they comp actually compared him to Vermeer. So the quality of light in an Etrick house was compared to a Vermeer painting. And I thought, God, that is great. What if we could do that in a public building, an institutional building? Wouldn't that be great? So lo and behold, we got a competition. Um, we entered a competition, uh, not for a private client, but sponsored by the Department of the Environment in Chicago and the Department of Housing. And what they proposed to do was do five case study homes, infill row houses in the city of Chicago um, that would be green and cheap. Show us how to do that. So it was a two-stage competition, and we were very fortunate to be selected. This is the Factor 10 house. It uh, reduced environmental impacts by a factor of 10 in comparison to a standard house built at the time. And a lot of the secret here was really how to bring daylight into the middle of a row house in Chicago. I lived in one at the time, and it was just like a cave. So we circled, we brought a lot of people through this house, and they, they actually commented that of the five houses, it was actually the smallest. They felt like it was the biggest because of the way the light was handled, because of the way we handled the vistas. So 1,200 square foot house, $120 a square foot. This is 22 years ago. And um, this, this project got more ink than anything I've ever worked on and probably ever, anything I ever will work on. Um, it, uh, it was uh, a 2004 Coat Top 10 winner. And for those who don't know, that's American Institute of Architects Committee on the Environment. Um, so we're really pleased with the little red, the little red house. At the same time, we started working on a library at Valparaiso University, which is just south of Chicago. And I had grand visions. <laughs> but such was not the case. This was actually a very pivotal time for academic libraries, libraries in general, actually. This was the sort of demise of the book. Um, we had a new dean of library services at Valpo who gave us the best site on campus right next to Resurrection Chapel. So it's like, Go all out, but don't upstage the chapel. But he was kind of radical in his thinking. One of the things he had done at UNLV is brought in an ASRS system, which is, an, is a high density storage system and it's started in the auto parts industry and allows you to cut building area by creating a place where you can have easy recall of books. 
He also proposed fireplaces and food, which 25 years ago was unheard of in libraries. So this was a kind of a radical idea, but it was a big success. It kind of usurped the student union and its usage went up 426% from the library before. So that was really fun to work on. That was design bid build. Six years later, we were, this is the only client that's asked me to come back after. <laughs> we <all> have, <laughs> um, they asked us to come back and the facilities director was really enthused with the idea that we would actually build a building conjoined with the library with the same materials. They hired the same team. They just went through it a few years ago. No problem. But when he assembled the arts and sciences faculty, they were like, we want our own building. Yeah. So they wanted their own identity. So it was a really great learning experience for us dealing with uh, identity and also dealing with parity. They don't, like a lot of public colleges, they don't have requirements for minimum square footage for offices. It was all up to us, just meet the budget. So what we did is we developed, you know, the offices on the perimeter, they got the views, got smaller offices, and the offices on the light well got not as good a daylight, but almost, and they got bigger offices. And we also gave them a marquee on their building. So same materials as a library, building looks completely different. Uh, it's it's the campus motto, the college motto, in the light, I see light. And we did it in 28 different languages, which are taught in this particular building. So the academics were happy. Um, at the same time, we started doing work for the Packard Foundation uh, down in Los Altos. These were This was the family that was behind the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, they wanted a, a foundation building that would reflect their values. So modesty, scale, they didn't want to feel like an institution. So we really worked hard to, to look at the neighboring context, make sure the building felt more residential than institutional. Um, it was also a great opportunity to exploit the wonderful climate down there and blur that distinction between what's inside and outside and create really wonderful outdoor rooms. Um, there was a mandate for this building to be net zero. So it was, it was net zero, it was certified net zero, it was lead platinum, and it was a 2014 AIA Coat Top 10 winner. <clears throat> Same time, we were working uh, up the street in San Francisco, reimagining the Exploratorium. Um, this was a really important project when you didn't want to screw up. Um, everybody had loved uh, going to the Palace of Fine Arts for so many years, and now they were moving to the pier which actually brought all kinds of opportunities. And this was a client at the board level that decided we want this to be a net zero energy museum and nothing had ever been done at this scale. So because it's a long pier with a, with a lot of roof area, we were able to get a 1.4 megawatt uh, solar array and we're, we bring in bay water to heat and cool the building. So um, really wonderful project, got to work with a great team of designers, negotiating the needs of the curators, and people hosting events. Um, this project has been operating at net zero now for two years. Um, the pandemic helped that a little bit at the beginning, but um, we didn't really think we could do it. We came really close with a spitting distance with the energy model, but that came close. But um, Lee Platinum and this project was a 2016 Coat Top 10 winner. Uh, my swan song project at EHGD and my <clears throat> first project with HGA was the Golden Gate Park Tennis Center. Um, there's a great sustainability story here, but the better story is an equity story. It's really a story about bringing uh, tennis to the people, all the people of San Francisco. So they, they, this building enabled them to establish a, a teaching and learning center for kids, after school programs for kids to be on site. Um, extended hours through use of court lighting, which they never had before, and accommodating table tennis. They showed up at all the public meetings. Um, and pickleball, which was highly controversial for the tennis hardcore types, but it's one of the fastest growing sports. So now we've got it all at the tennis center. Um, clients come in all different shapes and sizes, and we, we did some pro bono work for the Hiller Aviation Museum down in San Carlos a while back. And they have a great collection if you've never been there. And it's a great place to bring kids, but their building is kind of a doinker. Um, it's an FOB building. They sit right on an airport field. Um, and it's just a building that doesn't scream museum. They actually have to write it on the building so you, you, you know what it is. They came to us and they said, help us. Help us make this building have more identity off of Highway 101. 
So they didn't have the money to pay us and hire us to actually do a, a facade redo. So they said, we want, we want to do this with paint. So we stay, I negotiated a small fee to do an in-house competition. We had a bunch of people in the office uh, compete. We had a, a winning scheme and we presented it to the client. And it was really riffing off of the, the Dazzle concept that was used on war, warships and warplanes. $90,000 coat of paint. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's still holding up. I think UV has had a little impact on it, but it was nice to do a project and help a client uh, with little means. Um, up the road, Napa Valley College, this is a project um, that was done mostly by, so I'm, I'm at, at this point I'm at HGA. I think I made that transition at the Golden Gate Park Tennis Center. So this project was actually done by uh, our Minneapolis office working in conjunction with our Bay Area office. And this project is critical because it signals a trend that we're seeing in uh, colleges and community colleges in, in connecting to the community. So it's a campus building, but this is a multi-purpose performing arts center and music theater. Uh, it seats 550 people and it's got instructional spaces and rehearsal spaces and black box spaces along the perimeter. So it has multiple functions. It's very prominent um, from Highway, 30, uh, Highway 29 as you're going up from Vallejo um, and serves very different types of uh, performances, both for the community and for the college. And it's been so successful that they're now looking at repurposing this lobby that you see in this image so that it can accommodate small performances. It was not designed to do that acoustically, and now they're doing that. And it's a very adaptable building that will enable them to make these changes. So connection to the community, flexibility. Um, at Solano Community College, um, it was all about economics and speed. And this is a science building which was completed a, a few years ago. And we worked closely with the contractor to come up with a really simple partee, a really simple shape. And unlike a lot of the community colleges, buildings that you see that have sort of a, a collection of different material types and different form moves, there was a real distinct um, plan to, to shape the building very uniformly and use a tilt-up system so that it was a, a really clean exterior, which allowed more money to do the fit out on the inside. We had a client recently, Courtney, refresh my memory, a Volkswagen, inter Volkswagen exterior with a Porsche interior. Um, <laughs> so spend the money, what, what's gonna give the most impact to the students and be respectful and mindful on the exterior, but don't, don't blow everything there. So this project is a great example of that. There's a light well inside, which brings daylight into the middle of the building. And it's a really simple, humble building that stands out really well on campus. Um, my first project that I interviewed for at HGA was a small nature center outside of Minneapolis. This is a, a gateway building. And I really have to commend the city of St. Louis Park because <clears throat> they have a mandate now. They did a climate action plan. They have a mandate that all buildings will be net zero energy. And this was their first sort of pilot project. So it's a gateway to the forest preserve. It's a gateway to discovery for the kids who use this building and it's a certified net zero energy building. And this project just last week was named a 2023 Coke top 10 winner. Um, my team is like right here in front, front row. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, this is the Sac State uh, Art and Sculpture Lab. This is a project that's replacing an existing building, which is in an old fish and game warehouse where they don't have adequate ventilation. They don't have great daylight. This project is gonna solve all those problems and it's, it sits right next door. So we started working on this project during the pandemic. Um, it was a, a victim of a lot of starts and stops. They originally wanted to do a, a engineered metal building. We couldn't do that. Um, escalation, as you all know, in the last few years has been pretty, pretty tough, but it really, um, it really forced the design team to look at what was really important and creating a place um, and I never realized before working on an arts instruction building how complicated the mechanical systems are for these buildings to keep the processes safe. So all the focus went on that and on bringing great light into the space. So if you compare the two, it's like night and day. Um, these images show, and they're done by Mike Linder right here, did all these renderings. Um, they show that for us, it's not so much looking at this building as an object, but it's really celebrating the kind of work that's gonna go on inside and recognizing that this building will 
stand the test of time and it will weather along the way. So we look forward to a time when the students will uh, give it, uh, put their imprint on it. This is the last project I wanna show. This is a collaboration we're doing, a, a collaborative design build at UCSF Parnassus. This is a project we're doing with Snohetta. Um, we're actually working in partnership with Snohetta. We're designing all the technical spaces inside and they're designing the look and feel of the building and the landscape. And um, this is a research and academic lab and it sits on the opposite end of campus for where the new hospital expansion is going. And I will say that what I found really impressive about this client and this process is that although the focus has been on the academic portion of the project, there's a lot of focus on um, fulfilling the aspirations of the community in uh, getting people from Golden Gate Park to the peak of Mount Sutro. So it's been really fun working on that and developing all of these spaces so that people who aren't students, who aren't faculty, will really get to experience this place as they pass through. And uh, I would be remiss to not recognize people who have helped me along the way in my career. Thank you. I guess that's it. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I will, this will be like speed dating. I have lots of images, so I will click, click, click. Um, again, this is, this is uh, a little bit about sort of how I, how I ended up doing a lot of stuff with the water. And, and actually how community-based all of those projects are. In fact, here in equity, um, I would say probably 80% of our work right now is about sort of satisfying that and trying to deal uh, with all of the complexities of, of equity in, in our work. Um, and then, of course, what goes along with that are all of these other things like wellness, recreation, athletics, and sports. So this is uh, kind of, I, I think, sort of hanging out at this pool here. That's uh, my junior high school. And uh, as a kid, I probably spent you know, every day for about 13 years there. I uh, loved it. I uh, just did a lot of swimming, goofing around in the water. And if I wasn't there, I was on a baseball field. And my dad was hitting me grounder after grounder. And I was sure I was going to be a shortstop for the Yankees. But that didn't <laughs> quite work out. Um, but I stuck with it and I got to play until uh, actually just last year. So uh, still playing baseball, love doing it. And uh, and that's my big inspiration right there, that that group there. So that's Karen, Aaron and Nate. And uh, they've kept me going through a lot of stuff. But then there was this cinematic epic movie <laughs> and it was about my kid life. And again, these, these guys here, they got to swim all day and then play baseball. So I thought, wow, that's just like me. And, uh, but there was also a real sense of community that went on in this movie. And I, I think that's why I loved it. So again, it's uh, you know one of the best foreign films I've ever seen, which is just fabulous. Uh, so the, it, after, after kind of kid life and all of that, I went to Berkeley. Uh, I met my wife, Karen, there. And uh, then I hung out in my dad's office for a little bit after graduation. So it was a small landscape architecture firm and got to work on lots of parks and lots of recreation stuff, had a great time, came back to Berkeley for grad school. But right before that, married Karen. And uh, that's where I met Don Logan and Barry Albasani, Frank Fuller, Carol Shen, uh, just uh, David Pettit, just a great group of folks. And uh started at ELS and I hung out there for about 19 years and got exposed to a number of wonderful projects and talented folks. And uh, a little bit after that, I was uh, recruited away by Canon Design and I opened their San Francisco office, mostly to work on sports stuff. And that was, that was a lot of fun. It, again, it went from being this sort of boutique exposure uh, to a mega firm. And that was a very, very different scene. Uh, but I learned a ton. I met some really great people there and then had a chance to come back to ELS 
And uh, the board there uh, said, you know what, why don't we elect you our CEO? And that was really nice. And uh, so that's, that's how that ended up. So that was about, that was about 2008 or so. And uh, from there, um, I didn't get to do a whole lot of traveling when I uh, could grief until after college. I just didn't have any money. There wasn't any money around. Our vacations were trips in the car and we got to go to San Diego or Los Angeles from Elk Grove, California. So that was a pretty big deal. But uh, then I, what I found myself doing though is just going to water. Wherever we went, we had to be near water. And it just seemed so special. And when I was in grad school, uh, I looked up Charles Moore's thesis at Princeton, and again, it was water and architecture, and, and that was kind of it. And I thought, wow, I really need to kind of focus on this, this water thing. Um, so uh, again, a lot of our projects, uh, they involve water, but probably more importantly, they involve community. And communities could be the community of a campus, uh, the community of an athletics precinct, uh, or, it, or it could be the neighborhood. I mean, the community that we, we all kind of know. Uh, but to get to any of our projects, there's a, a pretty significant uh, community outreach and workshop period that we go through. I love this phase of the work. Um, it's, it's exploration with the community. Um, it's about finding how to deliver on equity. Uh, it just, it's a whole lot of stuff. And uh, I just, I find that part of the project really fascinating. And it comes in all kinds of forms. Um, this is actually in my backyard of Piedmont. And uh, that was a lot of fun. So I got to do a project in my hometown, uh, my later hometown. And so these were the projects that kind of kicked everything off. The first two, uh, the first one started at Stanford. And I was really fortunate, right? That's my the first big project I get to work on. And this was an athletics precinct project. So in some ways, we were working with David Newman at the time. And I, I think in some ways, the athletics folks were kind of pushed off to the side. That's where all the sports fields were, the, the dumb buildings. And just don't get anywhere in the main quad and you're going to be fine. And uh, but we took it pretty seriously and we wanted it we wanted it to be a serious place. And we worked a lot with SWA on that. But once we got the athletics precinct plan kind of in place, I good grief, we got to work on six different venues within the athletics precinct. And through that time, if you if you get to work on one athletics project uh, and it's for Stanford, you're an expert. And, and that's kind of, it's interesting how that kind of happens. Uh, so the one I focus on, again, water. So this was the Avery Aquatic Center. Uh, it, uh, it was a redo of the Daguerre Swim Center. And uh, again, just a, a fabulous place, incredible amounts of water. Every college and university throughout the United States is jealous. Uh, they all want it to be like a Stanford. Uh, one of the things that Stanford had was its own dive tower. That was a new thing back then. This was done, it finished just in time to train the 2000 Olympic athletes for the Australian Games, for the Sydney Games. And that was a pretty big deal. So getting all of this done and keeping pools in operation uh, was, was a pretty big chore. We worked with Vance Brown Builders, uh, they were super contractors. Phil Cape and uh, a great friend over many years uh, ran this process. Uh, but again, David Newman was involved in it. Was a, it was a pretty it was a pretty interesting process. The dive tower itself, uh, the idea there was that it was acrobatics on stage, and so everybody we wanted everybody to sort of look in and see what was going on. At the same time, that's when this whole community center thing started coming in. And Don Logan and David Petta and I worked on this. And it was the thing that I kind of sort of cut my teeth on. So it was lots of late nights, but this was, uh, was a tiny project, about 14,000 square feet. It was at least my first project, and it's never happened since, but it made the cover of record. That was really exciting. And I thought, wow. And I remember, I think it was Jeff Heller. I heard him say he had a project that made the cover of the telephone book. And that was a big deal. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I've never had, never had a telephone book. So, but anyway, this was, this was a ton of fun. Um, and again, it was, uh, in a somewhat underserved area. So we were starting to get a hint of, uh, again, what these community centers meant uh, to, the, to the people they served. 
So the next few that came about, uh, first one was East Oakland. Uh, East Oakland was a lot of fun. It started out as an Olympic training center. Uh, the greater sort of San Francisco Bay Area was putting together a bid to host the 2012 Games. And uh, we did an enormous uh, rec center for Oakland that was going to serve as one of the training sites. That never happened. Uh, but uh, in talking with Larry Reed, council member who represented this area, he said he still wanted to build a center. He had about $20 million on hand through bond funds. And we collected and we put together a $20 million version. And that's what this is. And I love this picture because this is what the center is all about. Um, again, it's a, it's a little beacon in East Oakland. Uh, East Oakland at the time had 101 drive-by homicides when we started. And, uh, you know, this wasn't the cure for that, but it certainly improved the area and added some hope. And so that was pretty important. The next one was Balboa Park. Uh, we did this with friends, uh, uh, Kuth Ranieri and, uh, they had, uh, they had this micro business uh, eligibility and we wanted to work on the project and we did not have micro business eligibility. Uh, Byron and Liz are also super talented. So it was a lot of fun working with them. Uh, but this was a mid-century concrete box. Uh, I should have a before picture. Um, we peeled off a bunch of junk, took out all of the sort of opaque uh, windows uh, that were in the storefront area. We, we put in a whole new storefront and uh, kind of opened it up, let the sun come in. Uh, this mural that Byron, Liz and I, both, all of us, we hated it. It was like, oh my God. And then when we saw it, I thought, oh, wow, it's really good. So it, uh, it turned out to be a really good thing. So they should never let architects pick the art. Uh, that, would, that would be a bad thing. Um, and again, this connection to, you know, the outside, the hills and everything, it's, uh, it's just a really nice place to, to take a swim. Now, back in Los Angeles, uh, we had, again, finished Stanford. Uh, USC gave us a call and they said, you know, we need to sort of complete our uh, Olympic pool that we have. So the two bodies of water that you see in the middle are the USC site, or rather that was the site for the 84 games. So all the swimming competitions were held there. Uh, what we had to do, and this was a little tough, but we had to sort of respect this, I believe they called it collegiate Romanesque style. And uh, so we took that in. Uh, Anthony Grand, who worked on this, I think did a really super job of satisfying that part of the problem. And then we got to expose steel. That was a big deal uh, on, a use, on the USC campus. And uh, so we added grandstands, basically everything around the edge of the pool, including the dive tower. So this is our second dive tower uh, we added. It had these great spaces for the student athletes. Uh, so there was a lot of connection right on deck. Um, and then the little stadium at uh, feeling uh, that was pretty important to the athletes. So moving on to Elk Grove, where I grew up, I got to come back and work on a new community center there. When I lived in Elk Grove, there was one high school and uh, we had, there were two junior highs that fed into that. Today, there are, I want to say, 16 high schools and multiple junior highs filling in, but none of the high schools ever built a swimming pool, and it's a pretty big competitive swimming area. So we got hired to do a new center. Uh, they, that entry photo, those were Marco Esposito's boys. He's with SWA, been a longtime partner of ours. Uh, but the center has a big 50, a training pool, as well as a big fun water pool. Um, and then it gets really hot in Elk Grove. So this, this sort of long trellis, it's about 300 feet long. That provides shades for, shade for folks queuing up to just get into the center, but it also provides shade for the competition center and some other areas. I think I have a few shots of that. Uh, the light dashes on the wall are uh, sort of a metaphor for that diver who jumps into the water and the ripples dissipate. And uh, so that's the entry to the building and those lights kind of dissipate as well. But here's that long trellis. Uh, the 50 meter pool is sunken down a bit. So we don't have 
aluminum bleachers strewn about, uh, try to build in all the seating. And then uh, this is an SWA fountain at our entry, so you can get wet before you get wet. Uh, we, always, we always like that. Uh, this was dive tower number three uh, for the Golden Bears right up around the corner. Um, this was part of uh, the California Legends uh, Aquatic Center. This was designed specifically for the athletes. Um, the athletes were sharing the one pool they had with the balance of the community and basically were limited to practicing at four in the morning or really late in the afternoon. And that's pretty tough if you're a student athlete. So four donors stepped forward. We did a PPP model. Uh, it turned out okay. Um, and uh, this was all done. And the student athletes, I mean, again, some incredible swimmers and athletes. Dana Vollmer Grant, uh, who holds five gold medals, a world record, and seven Olympic medals overall, is uh, our is the ELS uh, Aquatics Programming Specialist. So I met her at the opening. She said, gee, you know, I'd really like to get into interiors. And I said, why don't you just work for us? And, uh, you know, go around with us and we'll talk about swimming. And that was an experiment that started six years ago and it's, it's going pretty well. Uh, she's, she's really sharp. Um, one little tie here, if you were to center up the pool, the dive tower and the entry, it would, uh, it would center on those pylons that are across the way from the track, which centers on some pylons of a little tennis center that we did as well further down the way. So we're always thinking about that stuff. Um, community colleges, I know that Mark mentioned, uh, we are finding that to be an incredible sort of fun playground. Uh, California voters have been very generous. Uh, they are, um, they've passed bond after bond and, you know, anywhere up and down the state, you can find some pretty serious work. So this was Kenyatta College we did in the design build format. It's their wellness and recreation center. It commands some amazing views. Uh, we did this with block construction. And it has three levels. There's the pool deck level, which is also the gym floor level. And then the next level up is kind of the uh, the rec or the, the, the exercise zone. And you can look down onto the court from there. And then the big deal was that we activated the roof. So there's a pickleball courts and a running track and a few other things like that up there. Um, this is, uh, so the, the light box there, that's the spine that kind of everything feeds off of. It glows at night. This is where we were hoping to use channel class. Uh, boy, is that stuff expensive. Uh, this is now a very fancy plastic. So we have a polycarbonate, uh, but we went through all kinds of gyrations to keep that as kind of a glowing element throughout. Uh, this is the, the entry to the lobby area. We're looking straight up at the chandelier. And then some of the rooms that are on the edges uh, of the building. There's that gymnasium floor, which is down below. And looking straight across, uh, there's an open exercise area, the gym floor below, and then uh, the views beyond. and lots of uh, strong young men uh, working out. And this is that activated roof. Uh, again, the, the views from up here are just incredible. Okay, and then our last dive tower. So this is for College of Marin, another community college. Uh, this uh, has, a, has a wellness rec center. It's also like Kenyatta College, uh, super community oriented. So at both places, they're selling memberships to the community to use the facility. So they're competing with YMCA's and other folks in those marketplaces. Um, this here is a corner of the building where we have the sort of weight and conditioning space. And then there are a number of rooms that open out to the pool deck area for various activities. It's pretty Spartan. Uh, we use CMU a lot. It's a beautiful material. Uh, you, know, you don't have to paint it or anything. Um, 
all the exposure, all the structures exposed. Uh, but the setting here is just stunning. Uh, this was our, this is the last dive tower. So the dive tower that we did uh, for Stanford, that was donated by Al Maz. So his daughter, Miranda Maz could dive there, which she did, had a great diving career. And then Miranda called me up about 30 years later and said, you know what, I'd like to add a dive tower to your project at College of Marin. So uh, we did that. She called when this was about 60% complete. So we had to add on that it's not easy. You can buy these dive towers there in kits. You can just fly them in. But it was, uh, it was a trick. Uh, again, design build. Uh, I think that's how it, it survived that process. It was pretty interesting. So I'm going to quickly run through these. These are under construction right now. Um, this is a little swim center for the city of Mountain View. Um, it's really a building that acts as a tiny portal to the back area, which is which is all big pools. And then in my hometown of Piedmont, this is, I think, by far, it sets the record for marketing. I've been working on this for 30 years. It's finally happening. And, uh, you know, if you're persistent, it, it'll, it'll, it'll come through. But uh, anyway, a, a fun community. It's been it's been a real neat process. And uh, they, they've dug a gigantic hole right now. It's a small building. It has about, uh, this, I, I think we're at about 8,000 square feet, lots of pools. And it has a big covered deck that actually was a second floor. But along the way, there was escalation. And so we lost the second story, and it became this open pavilion. Uh, Redwood City, uh, the building on the left is the senior center that is currently under construction. That's about 60 million, all electric. Actually, I should have said Piedmont is all electric. Mountain View is all electric. And uh, the YMCA is to the other side. And uh, we've turned, again, this what was a street into a pedestrian way that connects the two buildings. Another pickleball court, lots of connections to the outdoors. And then this is the swim center. This will be the second phase. And then stuff in process, this is for the city of Alameda, uh, another aquatic center. It has both an indoor outdoor pool. Um, and for the city of Oxnard, uh, this is where we're trying to use the roof again, make something out of it. Uh, this was, we were hired for this because of our work in Elk Grove. Uh, but again, another big outdoor center. And then closer by, uh, South San Francisco. Uh, this is uh, another indoor outdoor community center or aquatic center. Uh, there's a lot of wind in South San Francisco. And uh, so we have a, again, we got to work with some great wind engineers. They give us a design for a wall that keeps everybody on the other side. Notice they're all in suits and everybody on this side, they're in jackets. So it must be working. Uh, the natatorium and then there's the outdoor pool environment. And the last project, this is, we're working on this right now. In fact, I'm about to present this uh, in our third workshop. So again, getting back to that whole equity issue, North Portland had uh, sadly a history of lots of redlining. Uh, and essentially there are no recreation facilities, uh, anything like this anywhere in the North Portland area. Everything is in the city proper area. So we were given three sites. Uh, this happened to be Columbia Park. And this is concept one. Um, they're all, I think any one of them can be fun. This one here is a little long and the volumes kind of uh, slip slide beside each other. Uh, this is what the exterior looks like. And we're essentially gonna give the community a pick and that's what's gonna happen. So we're gonna do live polling on Thursday night. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, the, the bureau director is pretty jazzed about it. This is the third site. Um, and kind of the front runner right now, as I understand it. But uh, again, it's 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 pretty rich, lots of community process, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So, like Mark, uh, I too have lots of folks who I would love to thank, and uh, been pretty lucky to work with some pretty talented folks. So that's it. Thanks.
So you're obviously the expert in the cool world. Well, maybe Teldrine or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there much competition from other design firms? Uh -huh. God, yes. I wish I could say we win every one of them, but we don't. Yeah, there's yeah, plenty. In fact, some of them are in this room. <laughs> kind of kind of bugs me a little bit. But yeah, there's there's plenty of competition. Uh, no doubt. I, I can listen quickly, but I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's it's a very extensive portfolio. So I was just curious, are you doing work all over the country or is it primarily in the so the competitive products, we will get asked to compete. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Penn State had a facility not too long ago. We teamed with Perkins Houston on that. We took a shiny silver note. Uh, University of Michigan do a big uh, programming effort. We, we teamed on that as well. Um, uh, part of our issue in California, a lot of our stuff is outdoors, right? Mm -hmm. So this side of the Rockies, we're pretty strong. We get into that area, the other side of the rock, it's, it's a little different. There, there's, first of all, there's no shortage of talent. And, uh, you know, they have all these indoor facilities. So it's so much fun to be working up in Portland right now. And we have this indoor pool. It's a big deal. So. <laughs> well, it's interesting to see the connection between putting people in water and then you're putting animals in water. Those very energy intensive experiences. So, um, I mean, having worked with Mark on some of these aquarium projects, and I know that a lot of people here have also worked with Mark on some of those projects. So um, it's great to have a, a strong HD presence in the room. So thank you for that. Well, what's your reflections considering, you know, from an energy perspective that they're both intensive relative to keeping them operational, water qualities, et cetera? Do you think, is, is it- Are you talking to me? Or? Both of you. I mean, you're both <laughs> involved in, or have a history of- Sure. Well, I think- I think that the, the aquarium industry went through a big growth spurt. And after Monterey was down and the National Aquarium in Baltimore, you started seeing aquariums all over. And uh, Monterey had an unfair advantage because it was a privately funded project. Um, and it had like the best site mm -hmm. ever. And when you try to replicate that in the middle of the country with a, a bond project, it just didn't go so well. So there were a lot of failures. Um, I think there was also a time where a lot of municipalities were trying to do sort of a world sampling of different geographies and different ecosystems, which is very energy consuming. And I think there's we're seeing now trends back toward more regional approaches or more renovation projects. Or the project that you and I worked on, which was a major expansion to an aquarium in Long Beach, which had no water. Imagine that. And it was all done with digital technology. And they did that very deliberately, not only for the environmental message, but to be, they thought they could tell a better story using media and a, and a large format theater. So I think we're seeing kind of movement away from some of these mega aquariums with the really big tanks. It's it's sad because there's such a great educational message in those projects, but the reality when you're doing high performance buildings, you know the dirty secret is they consume a lot of energy. So there are ways that you can fine tune that and make them less energy consumption, but it's like less bad isn't great. Yeah. So. yeah. Are you noticing like they're saying zero net energy? Or? Well, we haven't been able to pull up zero net. Uh, I think a big step for us, uh, those designing aquatic centers, if you can stay away from greenhouse gas emissions, that's a huge plus. Because up until very recently, everything was heated by gas. And the pools themselves, to keep them at the temperatures they have to be, they're enormous energy hogs. So that's just bad. So if you can, if you can get your client to switch over and be all electric, which we have done on at least our last half dozen centers that we're working on now. And what we're finding though, is that again, it'd be wonderful to be able to generate all that energy on site. But most of our little pool houses, they're so tiny that they generate about, again, with PVs or PVTs, you might generate 25 to 35% of the energy you need. So we then look to partners like, uh, East Bay Clean Energy, Peninsula, Peninsula Clean Energy, and so on, 
So folks who, again, are trucking in clean energy, right, using the grid to do that, and that's how we're supplementing it. So that's been our process. And I think we're gonna, there's lots of room for improvement, tons of room for improvement. And, you know, that's, I think that's where we're gonna be. I mean, even today, I don't believe USQBC, they, they're still not including swimming pools in the calculation. So that's kind of odd, right? Your, your biggest energy user is not a part of that product center's calculation. So uh, again, I think we go all electric. We're, we're certainly on the path to a better direction. Um, and we, we're trying to eliminate gas in a big way. Right? Yeah. I imagine the, the facilities that you're working on out west here are consuming less energy than something in the middle of the winter in the Midwest. That's right. That's a, that's a good point. And in fact, you know, most times, uh, even out west, they're shutting down the fun water pools. So, right, the, the slide with all, or the, the pools with all the slides and the zero beach entry, those generally go dark in certain months. And then uh, the competition pools, the lap pools, those stay open forever. And again, it's, you know, folks just want to swim laps. Um, and if we could convince our clients to do one simple thing, which is simply covering the pools, that would go a long way to saving all kinds of resources. But it's, it's tough. It's tough. Is it true when you swim in an infinity pool that you're actually also losing, using less energy? Because I've noticed when I swim and there's high ends on the pool, the water's coming back at me. So I'm not just sort of going forward, I'm also dealing with like apparent friction as well. Whereas an infinity pool, it's just like, oh my God, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful smooth ride. Right? Yeah, it's, it's more frictionless kind of yeah. thing. Could be. Yeah. Um, I was gonna yeah, have a comment on water. I think it's somewhere in the low 20% of electricity California spent on moving water around the planet. Ah, okay. mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. the water is not free. Yes, no, yeah. it's not. <laughs> yeah. There's a high carbon content of water. Yeah, so it's not just heating the water, but moving it. Well, yeah, you can get these things in. It's, we find it depends on the community, but you're filling up a pool. Well, how many gallons is that? I mean, we every year that. Yes, right. It's part of the thing about water, by the way, is basically water to gravity. Unbelievable. I still can't believe that, but yeah. 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 I'm river, so it's good water. You can drink <laughs> water in river. Uh, At least you don't have to deal with poop in your room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed as well, there's a, the theme of bringing the, the artist into some of the institutional work. Um, in the light, I see the light. You know, it's really inspiring. When I listen to some young architects, that's one of their concerns about why they maybe move out of our profession because we don't really have enough of the presence of the artistic gestures or the endeavors within our processes. Are you seeing that to be a trend or like in, in public institutional work? I mean, there used to be a percentage held to, aside for bringing in seen, art. Uh, really mm -hmm. seen, like last few years, we had that requirement at the University of Oregon when we go to Fort Wayne up there in the science center. And we got, you know, even done when it was like, um, you know, good big water feature coming down the stair. And, we had all kinds of pretty fancy artwork that was part of it. And uh, but we don't, yeah, I said, what are you guys trying to do? We're not, I'm not hearing about that in the future. Not, not, it's dropped off, definitely. Um, I wish that wasn't the case because it's really, I think it's really enhancing and I think it's a great for our process to work with artists. Yeah. Um, we, we hear about it. When it is happening, it feels like we're kept apart. It's like the artists are going to do their thing or it comes on as an after uh, a decision later when it's a little late you'd like to be working with them and jamming very early in the process to come up with something that's much more well, that's part of the art. yeah i mean you had that good fortune when you were working like very much like mm -hmm. that was a lot of fun yeah. a lot of a lot of the municipal stuff that we've done there I, I can't remember a city where it is not a part of the program. The city, by and large, that we've been working with are still setting aside 8%, you know, it's anywhere from 1% to 2%. But, but I think, like Mark said, uh, they do separate us. We, we get asked 
Where could it go? Yeah, go. <laughs> uh, well, we can find a number of places, I suppose, but that's about the extent. And yeah, then, and then uh, you know, there's a, a separate artist selection that, that happens. We had it on the Westwood Hills Nature Center. We had it on the Tennis Center where they brought an artist in to do mm -hmm. like a wall or the, the lenticular wall at the Tennis Center was part of that. Um, so it's still happening, but it's not as consistent as I'd like to see it. Maybe we could be advocating for that more in some of our responses to these art yeah. RFPs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And what's apparent in the institutional projects, the, the needs of the clients are a lot more complex. You're not just being brought in to design buildings. There's so many processes they have to undergo in order to get approvals. So can you see, or could you give advice to what additional skill sets we should be developing in our careers? So we are very adapted, you know, responding to these diverse programs, like so much community outreach, you know, siting buildings and ancestral lands. There's a lot that's been asked of the architect these days. And do you have sort of reflections well, on that? If you all know this, but I, I think your ability to engage people and public speaking as well as in the design process, because I think sometimes projects that are formulated in a very few stakeholders really outside the immediate project or the consultant. And uh, I mean, for example, I was an expert witness on Millennium Tower for the Oak River, and I went through all the contracts and all the stuff, and all those architects and engineers were looking at the room nitty. 10 feet away was under power. And there's no average. You know, so let's talk about average. I mean, so this it, it's it's very easy to get focused on yourself and what you're doing and not have a broader engagement. And that costs my hundred and twenty million dollars. So, you know, it, it, that's a that's kind of a funny example. But it's it's similar in the sense you're not reaching out to people and connecting and, and making your project part of the larger pattern. Mm -hmm. I think there's a couple of things and education. I was in school a long time ago, but as part of my schooling, we weren't taught public speaking. We weren't taught really about collaboration. There might have been a studio offerings that paired artists up with architects, but the profession has really changed and it's not a solo endeavor. And you think about the way many of us in this room were trained, we were kind of off in the corner, kind of whipping all this stuff up in our heads. And all of our projects now, we're constantly talking and the, engaging the client has become a science, particularly big clients like UCSF, where you're stake, you have a stakeholder group of hundreds of people mm -hmm. that you have, to, you have to rally and make sure that the facilities needs are being met, the researchers needs are being met. And it's quite the puzzle. And, and we bring in, we have a a design insight group within our practice, which consists of researchers and social anthropologists and people who really understand how to work with people better than we do as architects. Right. And sometimes that's a little humbling, but <laughs> they are out there. And it's amazing to see what, what kind of information they're able to draw out. And we love that because we can, as designers, that we can then take that information. But I've never been really into programming that much, but it's now become so sophisticated um you have to be able to to do that and and convince a client they want to know about your process before they hire you mm -hmm. so if you don't have the, the people the tools and the way to convince them you're not going to get the gig simple as that i often in my own project as well i see there's the whole transition from one building to another the whole change management you know how people are able to adapt from leaving like maybe a small, tiny uh, little office environment to move into like open plan spaces and put them somewhere else temporarily, you know, for a couple of years. So, I mean, I wasn't even aware of that aspect of our profession and change management, encouraging people to adapt to a new environment that we will be designing for them. So it's mm -hmm. like our profession keeps, you know, educating me on what we need to be doing. So I made a comment in my presentation about problem solving versus seeking potential. Remember that? So we build buildings that last, what, 1,500 years? And we design them what we call programming. That's what we do in security. <laughs> and programming means you talk to the current set of guys and you say, that's what I need. I have three, I'd like five. Uh -huh. <laughs> and yet this seems to be both 1,500 years. So how do you actually ask that question? 
Well, you're not the building is not the client is not a standalone entity. It's a mutual relationship. The rest of society, the banker, the neighborhood, other schools, other whatever. And so we we're just trying to develop protections. We actually engage much wider net of stakeholders. What's the what's the role of this entity going forward? Mm -hmm. So we have some clue what the evolutionary arc of this organization is because we're building these long-term structures mm -hmm. and these are sacred resources, I believe. You know, just because you have money is not a reason you get to go buy them in my mind. We have to have damn good reasons. So I think it's really coming on the architect to take a much stronger leadership role in helping the client position themselves appropriately. Maybe they ought to rent something, not build it. Maybe they ought to share something. Maybe they should borrow something. Maybe and maybe they could build something. But I think it's a larger question about what our role is. It's not it's not just we traditionally we just say you pay me and I'll do it. I'll make you build it for you. Even that, you know, twenty four seven. I think we're also getting better in in arts buildings and these institutional buildings and really trying to better understand how people are going to use the buildings as opposed to just sh shaping a building and just hoping for the best and saying your prayers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think healthcare, even though I don't work in healthcare, I now work for a firm that does a lot of healthcare. And I think they have a much more sophisticated process in terms of looking at what's actually happening in these spaces and how to design them from optimum efficiency. And it's quite remarkable. It's a little overwhelming, but it's kind of remarkable to see how that's done and how they use you know, virtual reality to, to be able to allow the doctors to plan out the surgical suites and location of all the equipment. I mean, we've never done that before in higher ed environments or museum environments, but I think it's starting to have an impact. You can get into what we call process mapping. Literally, what's the process of this thing living mm -hmm. and being, you know, and you map it out and, and find out you know, you're cutting people out of the project, basically, to get more efficient. Yeah, it's quite an art or something. Can we open it up to the floor? Does anybody else have questions that they're interested in? Yeah, I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, this is kind of related to the question that Dr. Bernard asked about the are you seeing the shift? You know, we talked about sustainability and all. Are they still using boring chemicals or are they all going to the salt water system or is there half and half? What's the yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, we get asked that all the time. So the trend, right? First of all, uh, salt water bowls are exploring. So it's insane. <laughs> So what happens though in, in a commercial environment or a municipal environment, uh, the, 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 um, the public health code, health code holds you to a pretty high degree of, uh, of, uh, of sanitary levels. And uh, that essentially can only be met with chlorine, whether it's in liquid or solid form. So until that changes, you, you have to kind of deal with that at the municipal public level. Um, there are a number of sort of private facilities that we work with uh, where salt water and UV is used in combination. Mm -hmm. It's a little easier on the purpose, but uh, yeah, for right now, sadly, that's 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 better. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, with that, I want to thank you all. This is a really great presentation, all very different, a lot of material to think about. So appreciate all your efforts for educating us on your background <laughs> in institutional architecture. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I'll just let say the next lecture is May 25th at Civic. We'll have Craig Hartman from SOM, Mark Cabanero from Cabanero Architect. Rona Rothenberg and Randy Friedman. Um, so, it's going to be a great show. So, please come back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.